local and four lane. That's one of the standard tokens we, we support, and there's uh, a few of them. I believe there's upwards of 20, maybe more. Um, but you can drop that into your skin, and uh, it will be replaced dynamically at uh, uh, runtime with the appropriate uh, value. Uh, the, the resource key feature is uh, tied to localization. So what that means is if you use the standard localization concepts in .NET Nuke by creating uh, a separate file for your uh, localized text, this particular skin object will respect that. So depending on the portal choice of language, the, the, whatever uh, text you put in here will be, uh, will be localized. So uh, before I move on to the, the next uh, item, any questions about this particular aspect? Yes, sir. Uh, you move away from something like XML, I mean, you don't make this entire decision based on designers. I think there will be a balance with developers also. I just wonder if it's an indicator that some languages might not have taken root as much as others, and maybe you're kind of moving in another direction and, and getting away from XML, at least in skin design. Is that an indicator of getting away from it in other places? So the question is, are we, is this an indicator that we are moving away from uh, XML in other places also? You mean in other aspects of the core, right? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, we are not taking away the XML option. We just have heard time and again that this is one of the most painful parts of the skin design process is to have to deal with the separation of properties in a separate XML file, and we want to solve that problem. But I would not read too much into that as we indicate of you know, any grand plans to, to, to step away. So the tokens are still available to use. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, all right. So moving along, client-side widgets. So widgets, as as you know, in the popular Web 2.0 sort of speak, are mini apps that can be added to web pages. In the context of .NET Nuke, uh, these are apps that can be added to skins and modules to improve the user experience. But what I mean by that is we'd like to really start. Uh, allowing .NET new skin designers to create more engaging skins beyond just uh, you know, your menu uh, and a few other things. But uh, a lot of the user experiences that people find compelling on the web today are ones where there's interaction going on. So by giving a mechanism, uh, a framework uh, that allows third parties to create widgets that are then pluggable into skins, we feel that we can uh, support that uh, goal of creating uh, you know, more interactive uh, skins. Initially, uh, we don't have a whole lot because we've spent time on actually creating the framework, but I'll go through the list of simple widgets that are in there. Uh, again, this is an, another area of extensibility. So we've got you know, modules, skins, uh, providers, language packs, and now we also have client-side widgets that uh, we hope will have just a similar kind of adoption and growth uh, in terms of third parties creating them both free and commercial. So the, the, one of the first widgets is the rotator widget, which as its name suggests, will uh, rotate your page around in three. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, it, it, is, uh, it is a very simple widget that will allow you to do one of several things. Uh, it'll allow you to take uh, a file folder full of images and uh, display them in sequence uh, at a time delay that you specify and using a blend option that you, you specify. So it's great for slow fading on the header or in areas like that. Or if you want to put something in a home page template that's uh, going through some marketing campaigns, etc., it would be a good use of that. Of course, uh, static images are only so good because things change very fast. And so the rotator widget, widget can also consume RSS feeds, which pretty much uh, makes it possible to have any kind of content available from your skin uh, in, in a rotated uh, uh, basis. It also has the ability to uh, read directly from the markup on the page. So if you have an unordered list and have content uh, hidden on the page, you can have it rotate uh, that also. So it's a very simple uh, uh, widget. It does not use Flash. It's just plain old JavaScript. Uh, style sheet widget. This is uh, a widget that allows uh, you to essentially dynamically inject a user-selected style sheet into the page uh, on, on the browser side. So what would some possible uses of it, uh, what could some possible uses of it be? Uh, well, perhaps uh, you have templates available with different themes. Uh, you have different backgrounds that you want a user to be able to select. So you could use it to personalize uh, the skin for end users. So you could have a selection of uh, backgrounds that you could choose from that. You could allow your uh, skin to scale 
uh, width-wise, depending on the uh, user's resolution. Uh, so there's uh, many possible applications of it. Basically, anything that you can put into a style sheet that can dynamically impact the page, the style sheet widget will let you do. Uh, the next one is the style scrubber widget. This one uh, came out of uh, my pain. Uh, pain in the fact that many module developers, and indeed the core itself, has lots of hard-coded style attributes in many places that really impede the ability for a designer uh, to, to skin something really well. Because, as you know, the attribute that uh, attribute definition in CSS is cascading, and the one that's last always wins. When you have a local style definition attribute, it kind of makes it very difficult to override it with a style sheet definition. So the style scrubber widget does exactly what it says. Uh, you give it a class name, uh, it will go find all elements that have that class name, and it will remove all the style attributes in the browser from, that, uh, from those elements. And what that will do is allow you to overwrite them using your style sheet or your skin CSS or, or whatever. Um, you can also specify an element ID and say that from this element ID down, just blow away all these attributes. Perhaps there's a, a table with width specified. Tell it to remove all the width attributes from the table and allow CSS to dominate. So it's sort of, uh, without messing with code or anything like that, you can improve the user experience a bit on the, on the client side. Uh, the relocation widget. Uh, this one, uh, I, I probably should rename it. It's not a very uh, interesting name. Uh, this is really targeted towards SEO uh, and uh, SEM. Uh, search engines uh, typically rank content that's higher on the page, uh, give, give it more, more uh, uh, precedence. Um, I'm not an SEO expert, but that's what I, I, I read. So what this particular thing allows you to do is on the server side, have content that's most important in the page uh, appear at the top. But when it appears in the browser, that content can be dynamically relocated into any other portion of the page. Therefore, the user gets a different visual experience than what, what the spider does. And that's allowed under the rules. We're not changing the page content. We're just dynamically moving things around on, on, on the page. Um, the visibility uh, widget, uh, pretty uh, a simple concept there. It allows you, uh, as a designer, to create areas on your page that are uh, hidden from the end user. And the visibility widget will allow you to define an icon that is displayed. When the user clicks on the icon, whatever that area is that you've hidden, wherever it might be on the page, will appear. And then when the user clicks on the icon again, it will collapse and, and dis disappear. So in a sense, it allows you to sort of have remote blocks of, uh, of, of HTML code that can be displayed and hidden at the user's command where the action can occur somewhere else on the page. So you'll see an example of that if you have uh, uh, time. A PNG transparency widget. As most of you are uh, probably aware, with the IE6 uh, does not support alpha transparency, so your graphics look horrible. And of course, there's JavaScript floating around that will take your image, uh, if it's a PNG image, and render it as a, a span or a div with the background. The problem with that particular script is that it is not DOM aware. So if you have uh, images that are uh, PNG images that are backgrounds, etc., that are defined in CSS, ain't gonna work. So PNG transparency widget just goes and finds all those, and if it determines that there, it's an IE6 brow or IE7 or less browser, it will apply an app, uh, a filter and make those transparent. So that it's just a supportive kind of uh, widget. Uh, the pink collapse uh, widget has an asterisk because Sean and I were just talking and we might have a different solution for it. But what this is intended to address is the fact that today, if you're using a table-based layout, there is a, a class that is automatically injected into the panes that are empty to allow them to be hidden from view. Uh, so they basically collapse. However, if you have a a semantic design using divs, uh, and you have, for example, negative margins or, or, and such, even if the pane is collapsed, uh, the space it was occupying will still be visible. Uh, what the pane collapse widget does is allow you to define rules that allow this, that collapsing feature to work even with uh, semantic uh, designs. So, uh, 